Welcome to Kurt. He is joining us from the U.S. Geological Survey from the Great Lakes Science Center, and he will be presenting on developing new Phragmites treatments based on genetic and microbial biotechnology. Cool. Thank you, Michaela. I am, we're, we're just a minute or two early, so I am just going to do a little more intro and just offer that I'm a uh, research wetland ecologist uh, based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Study coastal wetland restoration and management and invasive species, of course, are a big challenge in our coastal wetlands on, on all the lakes, uh, inland and the Great Lakes. And so um, research associated with Phragmites a bit is what I'm going to get to share with you today. And uh, I, I guess I would like to just start by recognizing that while, while my name was on the as the, as the lead author on the um, agenda, you see up on the screen there the collaborative effort that the work that I'm going to present uh, really represents. Folks, uh, Wes Pickford, who was in the other session, just finished up, probably making his way uh, this way. Also, but uh, Jim White and uh, Kate Kingsley at, at Rutgers University and uh, Keith Clay at Tulane and, and Danielle Snow and, and, and lots of other folks. Most of you know, it usually takes uh, a whole group of people to, to do good work. And so I'm just happy to be able to represent some of that work and hopefully share some, um, some new things that are, that are in the works that hopefully provide some new tools down the road for you. Unfortunately, I don't have the, uh, the ability to say that we are presenting or revealing something significant, but again, there's lots of encouraging ideas to share. And that's what I'm hoping you take away from this. So if you're if you're here, you already know what Phragmites is. We're at the end of a day uh, here that is at the end of a couple good weeks of, of talks um, from the previous presentations, previous meetings. We've talked a whole lot about Phragmites in many different aspects that I think of set up, uh, you know, provide a great foundation for all of us here and foundation for what I am going to talk about. I'll just emphasize that, you know, it's a tremendous amount of growth form, right? So there are the native, there is the native subspecies that, you know, we have all over the U.S. as well, uh, but it's this non-native that's causing so much um, challenge for, for managers and this huge growth form above ground and below ground. You know, oftentimes we say two-thirds of the plant is below ground. So uh, there's a lot of biomass. And, and as Erica said at the beginning, I think articulated really well, it just, it just really impacts our, our, our water and our wildlife and our, our way of life overall. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about, the rest of this talk to be focused mostly on the invasive Phragmites, but it is important in the negative aspects associated with that. I think it is a good opportunity here just to share that there is uh, an increasing amount of discussion going on about the positive traits that this plant does provide to the landscape, not just the natural connectivity that we've heard about as being part of the, the balance of our systems, but um, the, there was a question about carbon sequestration early on. Related to that is, especially along the U.S. Atlantic coast, there are discussions going on about where uh, invasive Phragmites has taken over salt marshes, and the question is, is it better to have invasive Phragmites and maintaining some level of salt marsh or uh, not you know, fight the Phragmites and lose salt marshes to sea level rise or, or maybe some, some other challenges oh, um, regarding soil erosion and so on. And there's similar discussions going on in the, in the very coastal Louisiana on the Gulf Coast. So the, there's some interesting discussions going on that uh, focus on some of those neutral or positive benefits that the invasive Phragmites can have. But in the Great Lakes, for the most part, uh, we're all really, really feeling the effects, the negative effects of this plant taking over the ecosystems and causing impacts to, to people and ecosystems. This impact is huge. Of course, I have this image of, of the Great Lakes. This is an EdMaps image. I know there are comparable data for, um, for Canada, but you know the reality is this is a North America problem. It's not just a a small scale problem, site specific problem. And we've heard that throughout. I think that's part really reflected in the fact that we have all of these action plans and these, these binational, multinational agreements that, you know, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and provincial and state management plans and so on, that this is, this is a pretty big impact or pretty big focus for lots of different management agencies, landowners, managers, and so on which is part of what drove the creation of the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative. Erica introduced that during, uh, during the earlier session of the day. 
uh, collaborative focused on this idea of collective impact and uh, really trying to build out the, the collective work that's going on on the landscape. There's this great web page, tremendous amount of resources. No matter where you are um, geographically, there's, there's resources that can uh, probably help you. Um, webinars and, and research and maps and cool cartoons and all kinds of things. But what, but this doesn't represent the collaborative. The collaborative is the people and the organization and the, and the folks that are participating in this joint effort. And one of the key topics that keeps rising to the top is the management. How do we manage this species? And, and how, what's the best way to do it? What are the best management practices uh, given certain situations? There are certain tools that we have right now that are in the toolbox. We've heard about you know, herbicides that are used uh, a whole lot more in the, in the US than in Canada, but it's a tool. Um, pros and cons, mechanical approaches, you know, cutting it or, or crushing it or those types of things, um, prescribed, prescribed burns or flooding if you have the ability to maintain water levels or to, to control it. There's combinations of these. There's folks you know, working on what combinations of these are the best. Uh, but there's there's just challenge with with any of these, uh, depending on where you're at and the resources you have. All of these are, are pretty resource specific, uh, resource intensive. Sorry, and so they, it takes a lot to to make these happen at any kind of landscape scale. And they're also um, species in specific, right? They they um, affect whatever species are mixed in with Phragmites, whether they be special interest species or uh, or just you know good good native plants that we don't want to disturb. There's also questions about which you know what the effectiveness are of these and and how we can learn more. Which is the foundation of what also you heard about already is the Phragmites adaptive management framework, which is a, a formalized approach to try to use this collective learning from what's going on in the landscape all over the place to to help um, help the collective understanding of how. This plant responds to these management actions and then give that information back to the managers to help them make decisions. And this is a cycle. This is an adaptive management cycle. So I really encourage um, if you're not already participating in, in PAMP, certainly learn, learn about it and, and consider participating, especially if you're in the, in the Great Lakes Basin. So we're learning more with these tools that we have, but the messages that keep coming up is we need more tools in the toolbox and that came up earlier. And uh, so uh, that's part of what I'm going to talk to you here about of the work we're doing for more tools. A couple of talks ago, Michael, you gave a great talk about uh, your insect uh, biocontrol work, and uh, I was interested to, to hear that. I'm not going to talk about that more than introduce it as a, another alternative tool that's being developed and that we're still learning more about and figure out how that fits in with this, this broad integrated approach to, to manage this plant on the landscape. So I'm gonna to talk to you about these two, two blue boxes here. Um, the first one being focused on the microbiome or the bacteria and fungi that are in and around all plants and, and targeting that as a potential uh, control approach. And the second is genetic biocontrol and thinking about the traits that Phragmites has and if we could target those in a species specific way. So let me talk about each of these kind of in sequence here. Um, so first is the microbiome. And so we've taken lessons from uh, what we already know about human health. And if you think about antibiotics, well-established, well-known, well-studied, probiotics, pretty well-known, uh, you know, fairly well-studied, are all related to the role that the bacteria and, and uh, you know, other microorganisms play within the human body and our digestive system and elsewhere. And we know that they provide benefits, right? Benefits um, to, um, to our health. So taking that idea of, of having these microbes and those symbiotic relationships where each organism gets a benefit or at least they're, they're neutral of one another, taking that idea and applying it to plants. And literature supports this. There are, there are microbes in, on, and around all plants all over the place, in the stems and leaves and soil. And we also know that they do provide benefits to the plants, stress tolerance and drought resistance and, and flooding tolerance and so on. So it's pretty well established that there are bacteria and fungi and, and oomycetes and, and other organisms that are all associated with these plants. So our question is then, okay, so if we know that they're there and we know that they form these associations and provide benefits to plants, can we target that? Can we disturb that, that symbiosis uh, and create a dysbiosis to um, target the Phragmites and use that as a form of control. 
So that's the work that's been going on for several years now. When we, we started developing this idea, uh, we created and, and developed a, a multi-agency, multi-institution research on collaborative. So essentially took the idea of the collective impact that the Phragmites, Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative has, but um, adjusted it, adapted it to a research focus. And to do, uh, in order to create this structure that really helped the research build on individual efforts and achieve this ultimate goal of, of having some type of micro-based uh, approach. We identified research gaps, we helped develop um, novel management approaches, we've done uh, a whole suite of different experiments and tests and um, um, research projects that have all been coordinated by this collaborative. Uh, there's lots of papers out there now that have been generated by this, um, this coordination, this collaboration. And, and just overall, it's been really healthy, really um, energizing to have this coordination of research efforts. Because so often we can compete with one another in research, but this is very, very collaborative and really showing that um, there's some real possibilities with this approach. And, and it even generated, we have a, a patent application that's out there, USGS and working with Rutgers. Um, to um, test a, a bioherbicide that's showing pretty, solid, pretty promising um, possibilities for disrupting the microbial community in a, in a way that, that harms or, or inhibits the growth of Phragmites and the ability of Phragmites to outcompete native plants. This collaborative uh, pulled together one of those early ideas after we kind of uh, get our organization together, we put out this paper that lays out a research agenda and that's what we've been following and using as a guide to do a whole bunch of different research. I talked about 15 some papers. Just here are some highlights to share. We've learned that the Phragmites really has a high uh, fungal diversity, more so in the rhizomes than in the leaves. The diversity is pretty high, but those rhizomes are, are more of a hot spot. And that's in the, the clay paper you see. Uh, but also that of, of there's a lot of microorganisms associated with Phragmites and endophytes being those that occur in the plant, in the plant cells and intracellular cellular, um, that there are, most of those are non-pathogenic. So they're non-harmful. And those non-harmful ones are, are much more common than the pathogenic. But even the pathogenic, there's very few that, that were identified as being very strongly pathogenic. Most were pretty weak. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and then uh, more work uh, by, by Wes uh, as the lead author there, Wes Bickford, uh, working on the rhizosphere. Again, recognizing that there wasn't a whole big difference between native and non-native rhizosphere uh, microbes, but that nutrients and stand density did seem to, to structure and describe some of the patterns that we were seeing. You can read more about that in the, in the reference you see there, but also this, is, this work has generated um, this understanding of what we end up calling the rhizophagy cycle, which has been really uh, useful to understand another pathway that, that plants acquire nutrients um, through the microbes. And so the, the microbes are actually enter um, the plant cells in the root. So uh, that is uh, an idea that's really helping inform some work in the agricultural world as well. But that came out of this um, collaborative. So as we're moving forward, this collaborative, uh, my work and, uh, and work of, of many others, we continue to test these non-toxic microbial inhibitors, short chain fatty acids and sugars and amino acids and so on. These are all non-toxic naturally occurring uh, components that uh, you know, think jellies and jams and things like that, that um, have antimicrobial properties to them. So some of those same components were um, you know, incorporating into the development of these microbial inhibitors. And working in the greenhouse, working in the lab, um, working towards uh, these, these field-based studies and really trying to figure out what are these mechanisms? Like what, what exactly is it if we you know, disrupt the microbiome? Is it interference with this rhizophagy cycle? Is there desiccation going on? Is there or is it you know, impacting nutrient uptake, uptake? So we're doing studies to try to really sort that out, which will help inform them as we move forward, how can this information help develop into some type of, of management tool um, down the road? So we're continuing to scale up and are really encouraged by this work. So I just wanna leave you with, with just a few high, highlights here, just that, and hopefully you can see how microbes are important in a real area of study. We continue to learn more that technology is increasing are getting better and better and we're learning more 
and targeting that relationship with uh, the, the plant uh, provides some real opportunities and is looking pretty encouraging. And ultimately, uh, this, this uh, is working towards hopefully developing another tool that in certain situations could be um, a, a good tool to add to the mix. So that's the research effort and a quick highlight of going on on the microbial side of things. Now let me talk a little bit about the genetic biocontrol work. And, and this too is, is a, a development area that could have applications in certain, er, certain situations that other management approaches might not be as effective or in conjunction with. Um, time will tell uh, how it ends up being most effective. So this work is really focused on the plant trait. So why, why is Phragmite so dominant? Much of what we've been talking about, we show these dramatic pictures, but it's tall, these dense stems, we have the rhizomes, all this underground biomass and high seed output. Well, if you think about it, all of those traits have a genetic basis. Something in genetic code creates those traits. So the question is, can we switch off the expression of those traits? So that's really the focus of what our work is, is shutting off the expression of traits. And we're doing so by focusing on uh, a natural process called RNA interference. So rather than targeting the DNA of the plant, it's the RNA or interpretation of the DNA and the process to get to expression of those individual traits. So conceptually think of it like a, a bioherbicide in that it's disrupting the plant's ability to express those traits. And it's RNA based, as I said, so it's transient, meaning there's not something to pass on to the next generation. So it would need to be a treatment to a, a, you know, a living plant that is then species specific, it's based on the genetics of the plant, and, and then there interferes with the expression of, of the trait big seed head or photosynthesis or something like that. And then when the plant dies, there's nothing to pass on to the next generation. So we're working on targeting some of these core foundational processes from the plant, uh, root development, flower development, and so on. And then working to understand, well, if we are able to, um, to interfere with some of those processes, how does that change the competitive nature of this, this plant, which, which is very competitive over native plants? So I'm gonna show a little cartoon here. I just think it's really effective to, to help clarify um, uh, a bit more about how we're working at the genetic level and, and what it means. So uh, we do know it's well established that all plant processes have this genetic material, right? You have the DNA that gets transcribed to the messenger RNA, the mRNA, translated into proteins that creates the traits. This is a, a very well-documented process, right? So if we don't want those traits, we can kind of work backwards and come back and target that RNA. And, and so this is a process that we call RNA interference or and others call documented as RNA interference. And it was kind of first described by this, this group in the paper in 1990, uh, Napoli et al. And we're making purple petunias. So they wanted to make more purple petunias because this was for a commercial operation. They said, hey, if we can make a prettier, or dark purple, whatever, they're gonna be better. So they took a purple petunia they took a, a mRNA coded, double-stranded RNA for make purple gene, and the petunias came out white. They're like, wait, what? Like, how, how is this happening? So then ultimately they, they figured out what was going on. They figured out there's this natural plant defense, uh, defense mechanism that when it detects this double-stranded RNA, it kicks off this process to, to counteract that and destroys all of those single-stranded RNAs at the same time. So if we, oh, and, 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 and so this was described in this paper, but it, it actually was uh, the foundation of this 2006 Nobel Prize um, that actually called this RNA interference and described this whole process. So it's, it's pretty well described and, and very interesting to think about as we look back at this graphic and we say, all right, well, if we were able to get into the plant, what I'll call this, this gene silencing vector you know, for photosynthesis, right? So if we get this double-stranded RNA into the plant, the plant says, whoa, wait a minute, no invader here going on. So it brings out these dicer proteins that kind of chop it up. It disrupts the mRNA, the protein development, and then you get a plant that doesn't photosynthesize. So that's what we're targeting in, in through this process. And then by, doing, by taking this approach, it's species specific, because these are pretty short codes of the mRNA, and they're non-heritable. So there's nothing to pass on to the next generation. And this is already, again, pretty well documented and it's used in human health. There's efforts to have 
RNA-based therapeutics. This is already a little bit old, but a good example. It's used in the food industry a bit as people are experimenting with, or, or industries are experimenting with um, evaluating whether this can make apples, you know, like the Arctic apple that doesn't brown um, as quickly as, as others. But we are um, evaluating, I think about this uh, in the, from the invasive species perspective. And, and this is, I'm gonna to talk to you about plants and Phragmites or keep talking to you about that, but it's also being considered for uh, invasive mussels or some of the, the sea lamprey or even uh, common carp are being considered. So there's work going on by others uh, with other organisms, but in plants, um, we've, we've pivoted towards with uh, at Wayne State University at Goldenberg there uh, a number of years ago was working with, with spinach and was able to, as you see the image on the left, a uh, yellow leaf, um, didn't photosynthesize. So started with, you know, kind of these model species of spinach and um, corn just in the lab to evaluate this process of how we might be able to develop these um, gen gene silencing agents and get them into plant cells. Because unlike a, a, a mussel or a carp or something that would eat something, ingest it to get into the system, plants don't do that, right? So we have to think about ways to get um, anything, you know, treatments like this into the plant. So here's a graphic that kind of describes the way we visualize how we're gonna get to this goal of having a gene silencing based uh, approaches. So, so the bottom first two boxes there originally started by, started by Wayne State, um, now being worked on by others, but um, working on uh, developing this genetic, data, genetic database and figuring out what are the codes, what's the actual sequences that are associated with the, each of the individual traits. And then work with a core of engineers um, to develop the vectors or the ways to get into the plant, into the plant cells. So then we can put these together and try to optimize that relationship, test that effectiveness, uh, repeatability, the, you know, how feasible things are in the field, how species specific it are, all those really real, really real questions that need to be asked and tested to, to see how safe these are and how they're gonna um, impact um, the, or you know, be, uh, what kind of effect they're gonna have under real world conditions. Can they be scaled up and all those types of things. So. Two minutes remaining, two minutes remaining. Okay, cool. Um, so that's why we have this effort then for working on the vectors. And this is um, primarily led by the, the Corps of Engineers, Ping Gong at the Corps of Engineers, and has some experience with these cell penetrating peptides. And that would be the carrier, the vector. And so if we can put these gene silencing agents on top of the vector, that can get into the plant. This has already been demonstrated in tobacco and rockcress and some other um, species as well. So we um, have experimented with a number of different candidates. I'm not gonna go through those, but these are different CPP candidates, putting different payloads or different attachments onto those, um, onto the uh, vectors to then evaluate, can we get into those plant cells and deliver that payload and then have the effect that we want. So we've done that um, initially by loading it up at the flor uh, fluorescence, just to say, can we see that it get into the cells? And then we did some cross-sectioning and look at these plants you know, through this, uh, uh, through a microscope to see, a fluorescent microscope to see if, are they actually getting into the cells? So what you have here is just, you know, what it would look normal, you got cellular bundle and vascular bundle and, and so on. So if we look at it this way with, with the normal on the upper left, and now, and I apologize to the, to the green and red colorblind people, but this is how the images come out. So bear with me. Uh, we have uh, the background signal is in red and just under, oh yeah, and then the, the, the payload, so our actual delivery are the little green dots that get in there. So as we zoom in and in, you see little green dots in the red tissue, it made it in. That was a big deal that we were able to get it into the plant cells and be able to see that. And, and I'm not gonna spend time on this, but this is just a graphic that shows that we got it into the plant cells and there's pretty good distribution um, throughout the plant cells. So this is a 3D rendering or basically just a multiple cross sections of a, of a leaf. So you can see the little red dots are the fluorescents that are in the plant cells. So as we're moving forward here, we are continuing to work on these double-stranded um, RNA complexes and the CPP complex and um, treating the Phragmites, evaluating that uptake, measuring the gene expression and working to optimize that combination of the treatment and uh, the and the vector. 
And uh, we're also looking at other vectors other than the cell penetrating peptides. There's been uh, new work that's come out recently showing good success with some of the nano um, nanotechnologies or nanomaterials that are out there, nano sheets, clay nano sheets, or nano tubes, or nano dots um, have some advantages because they can be applied foliarly, right? So you could you could spray it or, or or get a powder on, and it has some advantages that it doesn't get broken down like some of the other components. So we continue to test these individual approaches, and and so then just a couple more here slides just to say that we continue to need to learn about the plant itself and that genetic code to figure out what is the smallest genetic unit we can we can target so that we get that species specificity that we want. So we didn't have um, uh, as much information as we needed. We didn't have as much transcriptomic data as we needed. So we just finished up an effort working with Tulane and, and Louisiana State University to, um, to do the first full genome sequencing of the non-native Phragmites. Just published it out last month. The full data sets out there, the sequences are all on NCBI and it's all out there for people to check out. Here's the, the link here and it's open source for you. But we're, we're getting that out there. We now have the genome fully sequenced and it's, um, longer than microorganisms, but it's also relatively short, which is, which is kind of interesting. And the paper details a lot of interesting things about it, but just a couple of highlights here that there was a whole genome duplication event um, a while back that pulled away from different families. And, and also that there's already in the, in the invasive phragmites are high expression of um, biotic stress and defense responses. So if you think the plant the plant's defenses are on all the time. This is what the transcriptomic data told us. Whereas in, for the native plant, it, it had to ramp up pretty quickly um, in response to um, in, in response to some type of infection. So that helps us understand a little bit, uh, maybe in part why the invasive is so aggressive compared to the native. A lot more details in the paper, but I'll share that with, with others later um, as as needed. So I just want to finish here and say this is where we're at. This is kind of the pipeline of what we're trying to do. A lot of details here, but I'll just say kind of if you look within that blue bar that you know we talked about the genetic code, genetic code and the constructs and then the vectors. So we're trying different things, working on that optimization, testing it in plants, working to scale it up. Um, we're thinking about regulatory people approval, thinking about the, you know, the species specificity and the testing that needs to go on, risk assessment, how do you scale it up, how would it become a commercial product if it, if it got to that point, you know, what partnerships would be out there, and so on. So we're kind of in that third box in, in plant testing. Has some positive results so far. It's not going to be released tomorrow, or not released, but you know, available tomorrow. Kind of thing, but we're making really good progress, and and uh, so it's something to to keep an eye on as a potential tool development moving forward. So I'm going to finish there, and I'll, of course I'll put my email in the chat as well. I'm, I think I've used up pretty much all my time, but I do want to thank you for this opportunity to share some of this research, and hopefully I've provided some a few more things to think about and give you some optimism that there could be some more tools in the toolbox coming down the road for Phragmites, but especially especially with the the gene silencing work, the pivot to other species is, is not great. Because once you have that genetic code and, and we sort out this delivery approach of getting the genetic code in the plant, you know, uh, kudzu or, or um, cheatgrass or you know, pick your invasive, there could be um, development, I think, use this technology to work toward tools for some of those other plants. So I'll stop there. Thank you.